Only you and you alone are worthy of our praise and our adoration. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you right now, God. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. All praises and all glory to the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated this morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. God truly is worthy of our praise and truly worthy of our adoration. And we are thankful for the goodness of God. How many are thankful for the goodness of God today? Amen. And he is so worthy of all that he has done for us, how that he has given his son for us. And you know what? We just want to have a heart full of gratitude, a heart full of thanksgiving for all that God has done for us. Amen. How many are thankful for what Jesus has done for you in your life? Only some of you. I mean, how many are really thankful, right? Yeah. All right, so now God has blessed us. How many can say amen that God has blessed us, right? Yeah. So now let's be a blessing to the Lord. How does that sound? Yeah. How many want to be a blessing to God and to his work? Yeah. Say, well, I can't do a whole lot, but you know what? We can give to his program, all right? Come on, brethren. We're going to receive the Sunday morning tithe and the so Sunday morning worship offering. And I, I know you hear me say this every week, but you know what? Let's just receive a great, wonderful worship offering for God. Amen. There are needs in the work of the Lord, but you know what? Put that aside. We can just worship God with our giving. Amen? And we can give online at myntcc.org slash junctioncityks or on Cash App at dollar sign NTCC Junction City or just reach in the front of you out there in the backs of the pews. There's some tithe envelopes. Put your name on it. Pay your tithe. Give to God. And you know what? As you are obedient to God, God will bless you. All right? So you give. And today, let's worship God with our giving. Amen? Brother Jim, sir, would you please pray, ask God to bless the gift and the giver. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful morning, love, of each and every one of us that come to your house. Please bless the gift and the giver as we give in your mighty name. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You don't have to be sad. The Bible said, Lord loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your giving. And our prayer is that God blesses you abundantly. And really, we can't put a price tag on the blessings of the Lord that God's given to us, right? And we do welcome each and every one of you to the house of the Lord. We are glad that you're here. And we're glad that you chose to worship with us. I understand that there's a lot of things that are going on. And we're busy. And, and the army sometimes gets in the way of things. I get that because I was in the military. I know the deal. But you know what? Let's make time for God. And we draw nigh to God. And God will draw nigh to us. Praise God. I'd like to read to you this morning. Again, we do welcome each and every one of you that are here, new people, old people, young people, just all of you. Amen? So all you old people, we welcome you from us young people. What are you saying? I'm a young people. No one said amen to that. Is Eliz Hi, Elizabeth. She's giving me the evil eye, so praise God. I had to be sure what I said because normally if I do something wrong, she'll call me out. Right? All right, praise God. It's good to see Ruthie in service. She's going to college over there in Kansas City. And uh, I found out she was being here this morning, so praise God. It's always good to see Ruthie. And mom, too. Right? The way it always is, everybody's like to see the kids, but they don't, the parents get kind of like pushed off to the side. Those of you with babies, you know that. Like, everybody, oh, the baby. And the parents are like... What are you? You're just like the carrier of the baby bringing so the baby can be worshiped and adored, right? Right? It's all good. And uh, we're glad that you're here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. 
and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Also from 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. Now, that being sober there, that word there is not necessarily not being drunk, though we should not get drunk, but be sober, that means that we should be serious-minded. Be vigilant, being watchful. Because your adversary, in other words, the enemy, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And I'd like to preach to you this morning on the title of a message, The Devil's Tools of Destruction. The Devil's Tools of Destruction. Reverend Myers, who would you please pray? Amen. Now we all know that the devil is our enemy. And here we find that Peter describes him as an adversary, one who is against us, one who opposes us. Now we all know, we all know, now I'm not here to glorify the devil, but you know what? We all know that the devil is deceitful. He's deceitful in his activity and he's deceitful in his dealings with mankind. He is very evil and he is very wicked. Now, what, is, what did Jesus say about the devil? In John chapter 8 and verse 44, this is what Jesus said. Talking about Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. So, Check this out. Jesus said that the devil is the liar and a father of lies. So why do we listen to the devil? Man, I would to God that people would listen to God as much as they do the enemy. Jesus said that the devil was a murderer. And he said the truth does not dwell in him. So knowing that the, the uh, enemy, he is crafty and he is deceitful. You know what? The devil will even take a partial truth and or uh, you know 90 99% of the truth to float a lie and that's what he does he is a destroyer he is a liar he doesn't care for you he wants to pull you down he doesn't want you receiving from God he doesn't want you to hear the words of eternal life he doesn't want you to get close to God so if the devil's saying you know you don't need to go to church you don't need to do all that wait a minute I recognize that it's the devil and if the devil's saying not to do something that means that I should go do do it. There are those that don't like to preach about the devil, but I'm here to tell you, and we all know that Satan is always constantly attacking God's people if they're living in the will of God. Now, the enemy is a destroyer. We get this. I understand that. But if you're not living for God, guess what? The devil's not going to fight you. Why? Because you are not in the will of God. But when we make up in our mind, in our heart, and I believe every one of us need to do this, I cannot live for God for you, correct? You have to make up in your mind that you're going to live for God. So you say, all right, I'm going to pray. I'm going to accept Jesus as my Savior. I am going to live for God regardless what anybody else says, correct? Then you begin to live and dwell in the will of Almighty God. Then you get yourself in the will of God. You're following his word. You're following the spirit, doing what God wants you to do. And the devil then realizes, wait a minute, there's something about that man or that woman. I, I need to attack them because they're trying to do what God wants. The devil does not want you living in the will of God. But guess what? Hey, Pastor, you're saying if I live for God, the devil's going to attack me? Yes, but there is good news. And the good news is that we don't have to be defeated because God in us, Jesus in us, uh, has made us more than conquerors. Amen? We are overcomers through Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. And the Bible says that greater... This, this is great. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yes, we're going to be attacked, but we have Jesus on the inside who's going to fight the battle for us. And then we can get up and say, man, praise God, I have victory in Jesus. 
The devil will try to use you and use people to attack the church. Because if the devil can cause problems in a church, man, I want you to know, because then we'll be destroyed from the inside out. That's why as Christians we need to pray. That's why we need to hide his word in our heart that we might not sin against him. Amen? And so the scriptures tell us that we need to take heed lest we fall. In other words, pay attention to what you're doing. A lot of people don't pay attention for, in their life for God. And they wonder, why, why, why am I having all the problems that I'm having? Take heed lest you fall. Now, the older that you get, the more you try to avoid falling. All right, you young people, I'll just fall and get back up again. Well, I'll get back up again, just not as fast as I used to. And we, we're very careful not to fall because as you get older, you fall, you hurt your hips, and all kinds of things happen. And I don't know, does anyone here like to fall? If so, come up here, I'll push you off the platform. <laughs> just kidding. We don't like that. Well, what about our life for God? We need to pay attention lest we fall. And so this is a warning and instruction for every one of us in this service. And so I began this the other day. And so we'll touch on some things I already shared, but we'll continue on. But the devil uses tools to get us to destroy us. And the first tool that he utilizes is a tool of worldliness. Worldliness. Now, as Christians, we should not be worldly. Well, what does worldliness mean? 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Now, these are the words of God, not mine. Love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life is not of the father but of the, is of the world and the world passeth away and the lust thereof but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever so we see the lust of the eyes. We all know what we're talking about. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. The part of the world that appeals to our flesh. Now I want you to know this stuff that we call the flesh. It's, it has a strong willpower. Meaning it wants to have its way over the spiritual things. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. How many know what I'm talking about, right? How many times have you ever done something and you said in your mind, like, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm doing it anyway. It's like having an out-of-body experience. Why are you doing this? I don't know. Why are you doing it? Because it feels good. Even though you know, I ought not be doing this. Oh, there's only like three people here that have this problem. The flesh, the flesh wants to be gratified. So what does the world say? Man, you need sex and money and popularity to be accepted. Wait a minute, we're not trying to be accepted by the world. We're trying to be accepted by God, amen? Now listen, listen, it's very important. If you try to be a friend of the world, you cannot be a servant of God. Now I say the world, I'm not talking about uh, the trees and the plants and, and, and the stars and all this kind of stuff. But it's not the world I'm talking about. We're talking about the evil system of the world. That system of the world that tries to pull you away from God. And this is what the devil utilizes. And, you know, he puts things in front of our eyes. I, I, now I know, I just, you know, just let me say this. I know it doesn't apply to any of you here. None of you would have a problem with the lust of the eyes looking at things you ought not be looking at. Oh, it's quiet. I know that you would never go on these wonderful inventions that we have. Swipe, swipe, swipe. Ooh, swipe. Whoa. I know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like I'm on another planet. And you begin to satisfy the lust of the eyes. And that desire for the flesh to be satiated, to be taken care of. Amen? All right. Something to think about, right? And he'll use these things, but you cannot be a friend of the world and be a servant of God. And I really think that's one of the biggest problems that we have in Christianity today is that they want to be friends with the world and God at the same time. So it doesn't matter. It does matter. We're either going to be a friend of God or we're not a friend of God. 
You can't have it both ways. You can't be in the army and be a civilian at the same time. Though you try, it doesn't work that way. So it's either one or the other. Understand there is a great difference between spirituality and worldliness. Now I believe, I believe it's time that we as a people of God, we become spiritual and not worldly. You know what? When we get saved, we give our life to God, there is a change on the inside. Praise God. If there has been no change, there has been no meeting with Jesus. It's more than just coming to the house of God, though we are so thrilled that you're here with us this morning. But you know what? We need to be spiritual. The only way to become spiritual is to get saved and give yourself to the Lord. And so here's the question. When are we going to really give our life to God and live the way God wants us to live? All right, so you're here. You're making the right steps. You're making some right choices. I told a man today on the telephone, I said, you're making the wrong choices. You're making the wrong decisions. And I've already talked to him about it before. And you know what he told me? He said, I know, sir. He knows. And I believe with all of my heart that you know as well. You know as well. And so we need to give our life to God and we need to give ourselves to the Lord. And we really need to say, wait a minute, I'm done playing around. Say, well, I've been doing this and nothing bad has happened. Not yet, anyhow. And nothing may happen bad maybe in this life, but in the life to come, if we do not give our life to God and we do not surrender ourselves to the Lord the way God says to live for him, we are going to die and we're going to go to hell. Plain and simple. There's no way I can sugarcoat that. And we have to understand that. Well, Pastor, don't, don't preach about hell. Let's talk about love. Okay, let's talk about love. It was love that caused God to send His only begotten Son for us. It was love for every one of us that allowed Jesus to come and die for us and to shed His blood for us and rise again on the third day. That is the love of God. I want you to know that is the mercy of God. So you don't want to talk about hell. Well, let's talk about heaven. How many want to go to heaven? Amen. Amen. The design of worldliness is to get your mind off the things of God and to get your mind on the things of the world. Love for the world, the things of the world, will cool your love for God. And love for God will cool your love for the world. Now the things that you're looking for and the things that you desire are found in Jesus. And, and with the help of the Lord, we could just get you to understand this. It's found in Christ. We're out there trying to pursue all these things to fill that emptiness on the inside and the emptiness of our hearts. And if I could get today with the help of God and the Spirit of God to get you to understand that the answer is not out there in the world. The answer is in not, not in somebody else or somebody else or something else. It's found in Jesus. And Jesus is the answer. Hide it in your heart. Make it a part of your thinking that, wait a minute, I, I am going to stay in love with God. I'm going to nurture my relationship with God. I'm going to give myself to God. And then I know that God will take me to heaven. Praise God for that. The Apostle Paul, writing in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. In other words, I, I'm imploring you guys, by the mercies of God, that you present or give your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Goes on to say, and be not conformed. Don't fashion yourself after this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what, what was Paul telling them there? He said, wait a minute, guys, what you need to do, you just need to totally give yourself to the Lord. And so the message is for us as well today. We need to totally give ourselves to God. Amen? One, a life that is holy. One that is acceptable to God. We conform ourselves or we shape ourselves or we put ourselves in line to the will of God, not to this world. This world will deceive you. I'm talking about the devil's tools of destruction, worldliness. And then we see the devil's tool of weariness. 
weariness. The saved often get very tired in serving the Lord. All right, those of us that are giving our life to God, okay? We've come to the place, we realize that we were sinners, we realize that we needed Jesus. So we say, well, I get tired in serving the Lord. Now, notice I didn't say they get tired of serving the Lord. They get tired serving in the Lord. Now, one of these days, we, all right, we already talked about heaven, right? We want to go to heaven, correct? We're going to be glorified, praise God. But right now, we're living in the natural. We've not been glorified yet, right? But one of these days, oh, hallelujah, if we are saved and if we're doing what God wants us to do, the trump of God is going to sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive will remain, but we shall be caught up in the air and we're going to meet the Lord. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. I want you know one of these days. But here we are still in the flesh, in the natural, right? The conflicts, the pressures that we face are real. We all know this. We all go through trials and, and the pressures of life, paying the bills, not paying the bills. How am I going to do things? All these things that we face, correct? Now, just because we are saved... And just because we're on our way to heaven does not mean that we will not go through difficulties. All right? But thank God that when the trials come our way, when the difficulties come our way, we have someone that we can turn to. We can get down on our knees and we can call upon God and say, God, I need a touch right now. God, I need forgiveness right now. I need restoration right now. God, I need something from you. That's the key. All right, that's what makes a difference. The one, you got a Christian over here struggling, 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 struggling. And then you got a Christian over here, they might struggle a little bit, but yet what they have learned is this one is not praying, and this one says, wait a minute, I'm going to trust in the Lord from whence cometh my help, my help coming from the hills, and we look to God, and God will help us, and that is what we need to do. We need to look to God. But sometimes we don't do that, do we? Elijah. You've heard about maybe the prophet Elijah, prophet of old. Bible says that he crawled under a juniper tree and he wanted to die because of the words of the king's wife. First Kings chapter 19 and verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. There he was. What was going on? Elijah was feeling sorry for himself. Ever have a, a feel sorry attitude? <laughs> no, nobody understands. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Might as well go home and eat worms. Come on, how many of you ever had a pity party? God doesn't want us to have a pity party. So God, God is just not working. I gave my life to God like that crazy preacher was yelling to me about the other day. God, I gave my life to you. I lived for you for three days and 19 hours and 35 seconds. And here I am. I might as well just die. Why don't you just have a little temper tantrum before God? Come on now. You ever feel sorry for yourself? Nobody understands me. You're probably right. We don't understand. But there's a God in heaven that does. Many times we get just like Elijah did. People will say things. People will do things. They'll discourage you. But listen, let me tell you something. People may do you wrong, and they will because people are people. Just like you've done wrong to people. I, it never ceases to amaze me. So people complain about people. All right, let me ask you a question. How many of you ever complained about a person? Just raise your hand. You know you have. I'll raise my hand. And so we complain about them. We find fault with them. We criticize them. But what about you? What about when you do kind of crazy things? And someone says something about it to you, and you're like, oh, oh, and then you get all bent out of shape. 
We're in this thing together. Amen? Amen. And we're no different from anybody else. And people say things, you get discouraged. But let me tell you something. People will do wrong to you, but God, but God has never done anything wrong to you. Don't take it out on God. Well, I'm not going to go to church because I'm mad at so-and-so. Well, so-and-so's not your God. God's supposed to be your God. Well, I'm not going to go to church because Saul, Saul would rather hang out with Reverend Myers than me. So I'm not coming. Why would I take that, on, take that out on God? Are you tracking with what I'm saying? Why would you take it out on the Lord? I'm going to tell you, in churches, away from churches, everywhere you go, people will discourage you and offend you. When we feel exhausted, when we feel weak and powerless, we need to go to the Lord for who, who we need to go to, the, go to the Lord who is our strength. Jesus is still the answer. If you try to carry the load by yourself and in your own strength, you're going to fall every time. So here's the exhortation that I wish to give to you. Stop trying to fight the enemy and living for God in your own ability. You cannot live a Christian life without Christ. Bible said they were first called Christians in Antioch. They were doing what Christ would do. And so many times people say, well, if I just do right, if I just live right, if I'm just nice to people, I'll be good to go. No, we need Jesus in our lives. You know what? Living for God would be a whole lot easier if you put God in there. And God will help us. And we need to come to him for freedom from the burdens that we have. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, it's a great verse of scripture. We use it often. Come unto me, all ye that labor, just as Jesus speaking, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And he said, I'll give you rest. But we have to come to him. That's the caveat, is it not? The devil wants us to become weary in the struggle because of the weakness of the flesh. Jesus said in Matthew 26 and 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, the flesh. You're tired, you don't want to pray. You're tired, you don't want to read your Bible. You're tired, you don't want to come to church. So what do we do? We give into the flesh. Come on, now how many of you this morning would say, man, this would be a good day to sleep in? Right? But they'll probably get, a, you'll probably get a call from me later on and say, what happened, man? We're not calling to badger anybody. We're just calling it because we care for you. Amen. There are days that I want to sleep in as well. Amen. Amen? You think I always want to get up Sunday morning and be, ha oh, ha, praise the Lord. Sometimes it's like, oh, oh, praise God. But God helps us. Amen? Amen. We're all in this thing together. The spirit is always ready, but the flesh must be mortified. That means to be put to death. And we need to take this flesh and we need to put it in line with the will of God. We need to keep the flesh under subjection because the flesh wants to follow the world. The flesh wants to do its own thing. But wait a minute. God and his spirit in us helps us to overcome those desires of the flesh. And I'm glad that God will help us and we need to know that his grace is sufficient for us and God will help us to be strong. What am I saying? God can help you. We don't have to do it by ourselves. God give us strength. How does he do this? The Lord can use other people to help us. Thank God for the family of God. It never, it never ceases to amaze me. All right, I talk to people, I talk to soldiers all the time. Hey, come to the house of the Lord. No. Come to church now. They'll come maybe once every while and grace us with their presence. But when they need something, when they need a ride to the airport, they need a ride to wherever or they need some help, who are they going to call? Not Ghostbusters. They call the pastor. Hey, pastor, can you give me a ride to Kansas City? No. Whoa. 
whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? Amen. I'm going to help those of the household of faith as much as I can. But what about those people that, that you know, they call upon you and they have a need? I want to help people. And it gets to the point where I will help them. But there'll come a time when I'll say, like, no, sorry, man. Well, don't you feel bad? No. That's mean. That's mean. If I was a pastor, I would do this. How many of you here really know what it's like to be a pastor? Thank you. So you're just here for the money. <laughs> yeah, right. That's funny, right? Isn't that hilarious? Ron knows he, he counts the offerings. Thank you for all that you give, right? But praise God. I'll leave you alone. I'm not going to talk about you not paying your tithe. God knows. God can use people to help us. Thank God for the family of God. Amen? Amen. Does that mean you, if I need to ride to the airport, you won't give me a ride? I didn't say that. I'm talking about those people that never come, but yet they can come and eat food, and they want rides everywhere and do things, but they don't want to serve God. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes, I'll help people as much as I can. There comes a time I am not going to be taken advantage of. And nor do I think the people of God should be taken advantage of. And if I think that one of you are being taken advantage by somebody else, I'm going to say something to protect you. Amen? The Lord helps us. We can be revived through his Holy Spirit. Praise God for his spirit. We gain strength in prayer, in Bible reading, and even coming to church. God is in control. How many believe that God's still in control? And God did not save us to be defeated by the enemy. People stop serving God because they get weary. People quit coming to church. And they've gone back out into the world because they have stopped allowing Jesus to strengthen them. And they have given in to the devil's tool of weariness. You never, let me tell you something. People say, well, I need more me time. What you need is more knee time. You need to get down on your knees and you need to pray. You never win when you draw back. Well, I, I, I just want to retreat for just a little while, preacher. It's amazing that nowhere in my Bible do I read anywhere where God had his people retreat. It was always go forward. Even at the obstacles, the Red Sea, the Jordan River, all the various things, go forward. The enemies out there, go forward. When you retreat, when you go backwards, when you stop doing something that God has already told you, you will never be, be victorious. God doesn't want us to stop. Amen? God doesn't change his mind. We're the ones that change our minds. Well, well, I'll still serve God, but just I won't be quite as involved. Really? I might as well just say goodbye to you now because you're on your way out. The light of Christ has become dim in your life. But I'm going to tell you it doesn't have to be this way. I know the body becomes tired and sick. I know that because I know. I've been doing this for a little while. Now, some of you were here last year, and I don't say a whole lot about it, but I had cancer last year, right? And uh, it's online now, I guess it's out there now, I suppose, whatever, praise God. And I had surgery, spent 10 days at the hospital, 8 days in the hospital, 10 days total away. Then I had to do chemotherapy, and this was last year, but through it all, I still came to church. Not when I was in the hospital, obviously. But I still came to church, and those of you who were here, and I still preached. Yes, Amen? Yes, and there were some days that were not so good. But the good news is, huh, I'm cancer-free now. Praise God. Amen? <laughs> My last scan was good. Praise God. So don't feel sorry for me. Give glory to God. Amen? Amen. So the thing about it is, and I understand, the body gets sick, the body gets tired, and you go through things. But that doesn't mean that we're going to stop serving the Lord. Amen. When you become weary, instead of adjusting and looking to the Lord and allowing God to help you, 
you decide to drop everything, including God. And then you find yourself being manipulated by the devil's tool of weariness. In this service, why don't you allow God to help you to be revived by his spirit and help him to quicken or to make alive your mortal body. The Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit that's able to quicken or make alive our mortal bodies. Amen? Amen. Let me do one more real quick. I'll let you go. I'm not going to finish today, but praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? You're like, oh, praise God, preacher. You're going to stop soon. If you're thinking that, I'll just finish it, right? Hope you packed a lunch. Relax. Are you going to serve lunch after church, preacher? Maybe to myself. What you going to have? I don't know. Something good, hopefully. Maybe I'll make Saul take me out to lunch. Last night, we stopped at the gas station. He said he needed to run it real quick to use the restroom. He was gone a long time because he's in there buying water and cookies. Uh, cookie, singular, one, about this big. He gets back in the vehicle. I said, uh, where's my cookie? Well, I didn't get you one. <laughs> he starts eating it. Um, he said, you want some? I said, I want your cookie, man. What's up with that? Yeah, I didn't tell him. What about just doing something nice? Here, I got you a cookie. Thanks, Saul. <laughs> he pumped my gas. I had to pay for it, but he pumped it. <laughs> you really want to be a blessing? <laughs> I'll pump it. You go pay for it. Amen? Someday I'll pay for you. Someday. I hope I live long enough. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? Thank God for the family of God. You know, it's okay. I'll give you a cookie. So then he goes to the store with Reverend Myers afterwards. We get back. They go to Walmart. He still didn't bring me a cookie. <laughs> Por qué? Que pasa, señor? All right, anyway. How many love Jesus? Yeah. All right, commercial's over. All right, don't take that off my time. That was free. All right. The, really? No cookie? All right. He did make breakfast yesterday, though. So that's probably why my wife is sick today. No I'm kidding. I don't think she ate it. I'm just, I'm just harassing him. Okay. Pray for me. He's got adult kids. Seems like right. Devil's tool of worldliness, weariness, and the devil's tool of wickedness. The devil is in the business of trying to get God's people dirty. When we allow sin to run its course in our life, we become unclean and dirty. What is sin? Sin is the transgression or the breaking of the laws of God. What we need to do, we need to confess our sins to God, and we need to allow God to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and all sin. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sin, I like this, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then in 1 John 1 and 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that was shed for you and I. There's still power in the blood, amen? If we confess our sins. So, you don't have to confess your sins to me. All right? And when that word confess there, when that, the, whole, the whole premise here is that when we go to God, we see sin the way God sees sin, and we are in agreement with God and say, God, I see this thing in my life that I know that is against you. I know I'm not living correctly. I agree with you, God, and I'm going to give it to you. Take away my sin. I give it to you. Put it under the blood of Jesus. I'm going to let go of it. I'm going to turn away from it. And God, I want to be clean one more time. Amen. The devil. Remember I said he was a liar. That's what Jesus said. He wants to take away the joy of God's salvation. You know what? I enjoy being saved. Amen? Amen. I think it's a blast. I can't have any fun being a Christian. 
you got all these rules and regulations. It's not just rules and regulations. It's a way of life. And the Bible says his commandments are not grievous. They're not hard. People make living for God hard. You no, know, fine. You can't do anything. It's a real boring life. It's not boring. Amen? Amen. We need a restoration. David praying, he said, in the 51st Psalm, he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David had sinned. He'd done wrong. And he lost the joy of the Lord. And it needed to be restored. There is no joy in sin. Oh, I enjoy it, preacher. It's going to be a payday someday. There's no joy in sin. When the joy of the Lord goes, so does everything else. Sin causes us to feel wrong. It makes us to feel unfit to do the work of the Lord or even sometimes to be in the house of God. So maybe you sin and you say, well, I, I don't want to go to the house of God because I don't like that conviction feeling. Thank God for conviction. Now, it doesn't feel good. When something is said or something that is shared, you come to the house of God and I look at you, hey man, where you been? And you get that convicted feeling. I saw some the other day at the food court on base. They used to come to church as their schedule allowed. And it was always was pleasant to us. But I saw him and he, went, he kind of like, you know, did the, the head nod at me. But he didn't bother to come talk to me. Didn't bother to say anything. And I really believe it was because of conviction. Because people know when they're doing wrong. Amen? Unfit to come to his house. None of us are fit until we are washed in the blood of Christ. Deep down, people know that they need to do certain things. But they give it in to the tools of the enemy. And really, as I said earlier, some people try to live in both worlds. It cannot be. And remember this. A believer cannot be happy in the world. And a believer cannot be happy in the Lord's work with the world in them. It can't be happy. Walk on both sides. In the Bible, we read about a man by the name of Demas. The Bible said that he went back into the world because he loved the world. And that's why a lot of people have problems they have. Because they love the world. They love that sin. Those things that you partake in that are against God, you're in love with that. Okay. But what we need to do is, we need to fall in love with Jesus. Amen. We need to say, okay, God, I already mentioned this some already a little bit, that we just need to say, okay, this isn't working. I need to give my life to God. I ask all the time, how many love Jesus? And you say, great big round, amen. All right, good. But do we love him enough to get out of our sin? I know the world has a lot to offer, the flesh, but God has so much more. If you are genuinely saved, really a Christian, you will not feel right or comfortable in the world. And then if you have the world in you, you're not going to feel right in church. When you're really saved, Come to the instruments, please. When you're really saved and you love God, you're not going to be comfortable in the world. The things that you used to do, the places you used to go, you're just not going to feel right. Can I get a witness? Amen. Because God does something in our hearts and doesn't feel right. And I really, and I'm glad that people are here. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I'm not trying to get on anybody's case, but the thing is, I don't want you to feel too comfortable because living in sin is not comfortable. But I'm going to tell you there's a way out of sin. And when we as Christians allow the tool of wickedness to operate in our life, you'll find yourself stopping those things that you know that are right. You stop going to church, you stop praying, you stop reading, and you just try to stop, you just stop doing everything that God wants you to do. Because the devil has succeeded in your life. But listen, it doesn't have to be that way. Give it to God. Surrender it to God. 
And again, I'm not here to get on your case. I'm here to help you. I'm not against you. I want you to know Jesus. I want you to know his love. And he said that he'd give us life and that even more abundantly. But the thing is, you have to do your part. And God has set the table. But will you come to him and accept what God has for you? As you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes in reverence to the Lord.